The very first right found within the United States Constitution is every American's right to express freely, the right to freedom of expression. However, many say that in the year 2020, that right is under attack. So in today's episode of The Politics Show, we're going to tackle the right to freedom of expression in the year 2020 and where it should go moving forward. So without any more to say, let's jump into it. In order to really get started in this debate about free speech, I believe it's important to look back at the United States history of surrounding freedom of expression. And that really begins with a man by the name of Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was a Virginian founding father who believed in freedom of expression. And in front of a Virginian delegation who was attempting to ratify the United States Constitution, he basically said that if we as an American citizenry do not have the ability to redress the grievances of government, fact of the matter is, we're not going to have the rights to dictate what liberties we have, to see what freedoms we have. The government will try to usurp all of our power, all of our freedoms, all of our liberties, and take it for themselves, to make themselves more powerful and autonomous over the people, to make the people have no say in government. That would be the government's end goal. So he feared a too strong of a government, which makes sense, granted the United States had just broken off from the British crown. Though ultimately, he feared, government will be ter- become authoritarian and will try to take away our rights. They won't negotiate with us. They'll just try to become more and more powerful and strip away us until we're nothing more than cogs within our society. But we also ought to take a look at what we wound up getting. Because what Patrick Henry advocated for was basically this thing called free speech absolutism. And in the United States Constitution, it writes, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to peacefully assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. However, you and I might notice something that is missing from the United States Constitution's First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law. There's other forms of government that exist within our system, state governments. At the time of the founding, states were were allowed to limit what was able to be said within their borders. What you were able to say in practice in the state of New York was different than what you were allowed to say in practice in the state of Virginia, and in the state of New Jersey, and the state of Pennsylvania. Many different things. But that changed until 1925 in a Supreme Court case called Gitlow v. New York. And in Gitlow v. New York, the Supreme Court basically said that we are going to utilize the 14th Amendment incorporation principle to incorporate the states into the United States First Amendment. So basically, now the Supreme Court has interpreted the First Amendment to read, Congress and the states shall make no law, etc. So basically, we are now walking closer and closer to Patrick Henry's free speech absolutism. And that was even furthered in 1969 in a Supreme Court case called Brandenburg versus Ohio, where a neo-Nazi in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in the state of Ohio wanted to march down the streets. Now, Ohio had a law prohibiting this. However, Brandenburg, the neo-Nazi, went to the Supreme Court and said that Ohio was infringing his rights. The Supreme Court agreed and created a doctrine called the Imminent Lawless Action Test, which banned speech that caused a direct and imminent harm upon others. But it also, while, while producing that, it also had to produce a likely action to be illegal. So, for instance, murder for hire. And as we discussed on last week's episode, money is technically speech according to a Supreme Court case called Buckley versus Vallejo. So, when we have a murder for hire system, for instance, that would be illegal because you're inciting harm upon others with an incentive which would be cause a likely action. The likely action being murder, the illegal action also being murder. Therefore, murder for hire is illegal under the imminent lawless action clause. However, other things such as I really want to kill someone, that common phrase, is not illegal because it has it produces no likely outcome. Now, if there was a money or some sort of incentive attached to I want to kill someone, such as murder for hire, then it would be illegal under that same doctrine. So, this is actually a good thing, because it allows free speech to be pushed to its limits. And that's what actually is said in another Supreme Court case that goes by the name United States versus Rumley. 
which created this thing called the marketplace of ideas, which creates a society of competing ideas similar to a free market. And in this free market, and it's similar to an unregulated free market, it, it's basically this concept of let the best ideas battle themselves out and see who wins in the end. In other words, this is true free speech absolutism. It's to let the two ideas battle themselves out and whoever wins the public debate wins the public debate. There should be no action taken by government to limit this freedom of speech because at the end of the day, the best product or the best speech will wind up winning at the end of the day. Now, in our current system, that perhaps isn't really going to happen because of our money uh, incentive, the, the profit motive in, in such a capitalist society. Um, but in, in, in a perfect world, this, this would work. Um, but as I said, it created this marketplace of ideas. And in this marketplace of ideas, at the time of that Supreme Court ruling in Rumley, the, the, this concept of this concept of a marketplace of ideas would take place in the town square of sorts. However, the town square today has become a virtual town square. A town square that's comprised of Facebook, of Snapchat, of Instagram, of Twitter, of YouTube. In other words, private entities now control the private the, the town square. And they, in other words, have the ability to restrict your freedom of expression because the Supreme Court says that companies, businesses, corporations have the ability to limit somewhat what people want to say. You can be fired for saying some things. And because Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, and all these other virtual platforms, the virtual town squares of sorts, no longer have this, uh, this unrestricted free speech, these corporations are allowed to limit what you have to say. And I, I, this is a slippery slope. Let's say, for instance, that Twitter or YouTube, we'll use YouTube, for instance, because they've been doing this. YouTube recently banned David Duke and Richard Spencer. While talking about those two, let me just note very quickly that I think their views are heinous and morally repugnant. David Duke, for those of you that don't know, is a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And um, Richard Spencer is a white supremacist, a white nationalist, basically a neo-Nazi. And YouTube recently banned them off of their platform. Now, I think that we can all agree in my general audience that white supremacism is bad. I don't think that needs to be a debate that occurs uh, within, within the public discourse. Because if you say it's a good thing, I, the fact of the matter is you're just wrong. Um... But YouTube banned them off their platform because they violated the terms of service and the specific terms of service that they violated was they were inciting harm upon others. Okay, that's valid. However, to all the liberals and Democrats cheering this on, let me bring up this one point. In, in the news recently, if you watch Fox News or One American News Network or follow any right-wing spheres of influence you'll notice that they have been calling the Black Lives Matter movement a terrorist organization. I don't believe Black Lives Matter is a movement, sir. They're terrorist cowards. One that, according to Rudy Giuliani, that appeared on the uh, Sean Hannity show this past Friday, called the Black Lives Matter movement a movement that incites harm, violence, and destruction in America. These are quotes from people like Rudy Giuliani, a former mayor and a former presidential candidate. These are people like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and people on the right. And we can have the discussion whether or not these claims are actually true. I happen to believe they're not. But under that same influence, YouTube can then go ahead and ban all content relating to Black Lives Matter under the same premise that similar to the White Lives Matter and similar to these white nationalists, that Black Lives Matter also incites violence. That it incites a revolutionary ideal. That's not a good precedent that we want to set. And you and you might be thinking, well, you know, uh, that's not going to happen because the, the we we can realize as a rational human being uh, what constitutes good free speech versus what constitutes bad free speech. And I have to disagree with that concept because. We look at something like Twitter, right? And I'm using Twitter as this one instance, but we can, we can use other platforms afterward. 
Twitter is owned by this man named Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey is a self-acclaimed Democrat. He's a fan of Andrew Yang. Um, he's, he's somewhat progressive. But what happens when the next CEO of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or any other social media platform is a right-winger? Well, I think you and I both know the answer. Left-wing movements like Black Lives Matter, like progressive movements such as DSA and all these other extremely left movements, they're going to be called inciting harm or too revolutionary and as such are going to be deplatformed. They're not going to have a space on Twitter or any other platform. That's what's going to wind up happening. It's a slippery slope. But that also brings me to the next thing. Fact checking. So, a few weeks ago on Twitter, Donald Trump released a tweet with some information that was blatantly false. And involving that information that he tweeted, Twitter decided to go ahead and fact check him. Now, in... To some people, this may seem like a great idea. You're fact-checking the president because media organizations like CNN and MSNBC uh, can only do so much. But let me tell you why that's a bad idea. Because the second you go ahead and start fact-checking someone, you open up the floodgates to fact-check everyone. So what I mean by that is when we have someone like Donald Trump who starts preaching information about COVID-19, which isn't true, okay, that's, that's fair, and he should definitely get his comeuppance in terms of a response from the left or from uh, those in the, in the watchdogs of democracy is what the media is called. They should, they should definitely respond to him and, and prove him wrong and things like that if he were to post something factually incorrect, which he did. But it's not the public square's job to determine what can and can't be said, what can and can and what is or is not true. It's not Twitter's job, it's not Instagram's job, it's not Facebook's job. They should not be in the business of determining what is true. They should not be the arbiters of truth. Because let me provide you with this example. At the end of the day, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other organizations are corporations. So what that means is they have a profit motive. They want to turn a profit at the end of each year. Understandably, they're, an or they're a company, they're a corporation. Of course they want to. That's the main purpose of any corporation, to turn a profit. So if progressive movements start going around and saying that we need to implement a wealth tax or that we need to go ahead and use extremely progressive tax rates on these corporations, well, they're going to wind up losing money. So the incentive for them to eliminate or deplatform those people calling for those tax those uh, those uh, tax increases, the 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 um it's it's reasonable for them to want to ban them off the platform, uh, because they can cite well it isn't true that you need to do this and this and that uh, in order to ban them. So you when you ban or some speech. You open up the floodgates to then ban all speech. And, and as I do say, though, you do need some sort of moderating influence. And that moderating influence should come in the form of let's ban speech that causes imminent lawless action, uh, as per Brandenburg versus Ohio. But when you go ahead and just start banning speech because you disagree with it or because it's wrong, well, we've in the past learned things that have been wrong at the time and then come around to be true so take for instance everything that's been happening with COVID-19 at some point or another every fact that we've done that we've uh, that we've known hasn't wound up being true uh, because the story keeps updating because we wind up learning new information about the virus and about the disease and about how it spreads about how long it lingers on what platforms it lingers on we keep learning more and more information about the virus as time goes on so it's not reasonable to ban someone's speech to say that they're incorrect based on the knowledge we currently have. Knowledge is ever-growing. Knowledge is ever-updating. So we'll never know what something is for, for certain. So to ban it on face value because at the time it happens to be wrong, or it is hurtful to others, well, who defines what is wrong? Who defines what is hurtful? That's the philosophical inquiry of which we'll never have the answer to of who should define it. So when we go ahead and start with that premise of 
Well, these tech giants are going to be the ones who determine what is true and what is false. Is that the precedent we really want to set? Is that the precedent that we really want to set when these tech giants have a profit motive to then deny people from speaking, certain people from speaking? Are we really willing to put these are there into their hands what can and can't be said in the public square? Frankly, I don't think that's a good idea. It's not a good idea because, as, as Patrick Henry said... We lose our rights as American citizens. We lose our right to battle the government if the government is doing something wrong. Because similar to how politicians are in the pockets of corporations, the vice versa can be said as well. Corporations are in the hands of politicians. They work together. They work together to try to undermine the people. So, instead of limiting speech, let's embrace speech. Yeah, some people are going to be racist, some people are going to be xenophobic, some people are going to be misogynistic, and some people are going to be terrible, awful human beings. Like Richard Spencer and David Duke. I don't have any qualms about calling them out for that. But what we go ahead by saying that speech can be banned is we let the room for people who are good and are preaching good policy positions and are good-hearted people to also be banned because they disagree with the tech with the Silicon Valley overlords. We don't want a situation where anyone's speech is hindered just because they disagree with those in power. So that's where I want to end today's episode of the Politics Show. I really hope that you guys enjoyed and I might do a follow-up episode on this topic because it's something I tr I'm truly passionate about. The United States is unfortunately plagued with limited free speech because of our campaign finance laws which i did a whole video on last week so i strongly encourage you go check that out if you haven't already but as i said in this country we are on the slippery slope to losing our free speech because of these tech giants who censor and try to eliminate people out of the conversation granted those people are bad people but they shouldn't be eliminated from the conversation because at the end of the day the marketplace of ideas does work. And when you hinder that marketplace, the adverse effect happens. People tend to join those bad causes because of a taboo reverse incentive effect. So, as I said, hope you all are staying safe, be well, and have yourselves a good one.